Welcome to Filmonomics and Slated. I'm Steph Paterno. Now we are in mid-November and the American film market has just wrapped up. Now this is one of the four key events in the annual industry calendar when global rights to finished films are sold by foreign sales agents to distributors around the world. And when the rights to new projects are pre-sold to those foreign buyers as part of their efforts to raise financing for those films. We wanted to peel back the curtain to hear a little bit more about this process, so we asked the experienced heads of four sales companies to come and share with us how they go and pre-sell the rights to their films to raise financing, and especially how they do so with first-time filmmakers. So let's go hear from them. Um, I got involved last year uh, in a film called Hungry Hearts, uh, which um, we screened part of. We screened a, an early cut um, really, really powerful film, but it's, it was a tough one, um, and decided to come on board to handle it. It was a drama, Adam Driver, Alba Rohrbacher, and an Italian director, his first English language film, but screened enough of it and had enough conversations with the producer and the director to understand what the vision was. Um, and so we got on board because I just believed what they were trying to do. Um, that one turned out uh, well, it went on to be uh, win Best Actor and Best Actress in Venice. Um, so it was, and then went into Toronto and has won a lot of bigger festivals. But we had to screen it to sell it. I mean, we did a couple of pre-sales. Uh, a lot of people a year and a half ago didn't know who Adam Driver was, uh, if they hadn't seen Girls. Um, and now, of course, Star Wars, etc. Everyone knows who Adam Driver is. Um, but that was a year and a half ago, so there wasn't a lot to go on there in terms of pre-sales. Uh, so we cut a really, really good promo, um, which we then used as the trailer, and that also helped the buyers understand how they would themselves market the film, which was really important, because they were like, really interesting film, but we don't know what the heck to do with it. Um, and so it was like, here's the poster, here's the trailer, this is how you sell it, and that is as a really pretty hardcore thriller slash almost horror. Um, but it was a leap of faith. It was a leap of faith um, and sold it then once we were able to, in the majority, probably 80% of our sales were done once we were able to show the film. I was, um, I was making an offer last year to fully finance, to, sorry, co-finance a, um, a first-time director in a film called Voice from the Stone with Amelia Clark and Martin Sokas. And um, I was really scared, I'm not going to lie, to, you know, co-finance a first-time director. Because nobody knows who Amelia Clark is. <laughs> but it was at the time she, you know, she was just being announced. But you know, it's the, 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 these actors and actresses from the series, not all of them are yet meaningful. It's there are a handful, right? Amelia Clark, sexiest woman yes, on the planet. She is the sexiest woman. But at the time, last mother year, of she dragons, no exactly. one. Cares but it was about really, that. you know, it was the producer selling me on this director, and he had done a short that was shortlisted for an Academy Award. But it was really. Um, the producer's vision selling me on the director, and I really believed in him. I mean, it was Dean Zanuck, so it's not like it wasn't his first rodeo either. But um, I'm happy to say that was on Slated as well, although <laughs> I don't know what came of it. So was Carrie Pilby, but it got hidden at some point. Well, but Voice from the Stone had been around for years, yeah. as are many of these projects. You know, it was at, at, at many years ago. It was um, Maggie Gyllenhaal that was attached to it, and uh, um, but but I believed in him, and I you know I, I saw the short, and I believed. In the director, I'd never met him. I'd never spoken with him. There was a lookbook, but to me, it didn't really speak um, to me as much as Dean's vision and you know him selling me on this director. But it you know turned out beautifully. So, and how important is it if you're going with a first-time director to package up and get whatever elements you need to <clears throat> to boost the team strength? I think it really depends on the genre. I mean, if it's a first-time director in an action film, it's a little scary. But if it's a drama or something like a character piece, but Personally, I think it's easier to spin a story around a first-time director if there is commercial work or a short to point to rather than uh, try to sell a known director who's had three flops under his belt. That's what I think. Or have a strong DP, right. have a good editor to exactly. so build up the crew around the first-timer. So you can then, re I just did a couple of deals where that went, it went through because we had a first-timer, but we had that strong, right. uh, you know, endless list of credits for the, for the DP and the editor. And it reassured the distributor come in from multi territories, and it was all good. Yeah, that's that's super yeah. important. Surrounding. Thank you. Oh, yeah, because I think exactly the question with first time directors is often, can they attract the talent? Because it's not just are you entrusting them with a lot of money, but it's also can they bring the talent that you need um, at whatever budget level it is to support the budget. 
Yeah, and also like more sophisticated buyers in bigger key territories that mean the most money, um, they will be very knowledgeable as to who your DP is, who's your editor, and some some companies you know require approval over, in some cases like even stills and marketing, also very important that that's budgeted well and with good people because at the end of the day you make this great movie and you have no stills to support it, you're like, great, how do we market it? We generally, if we're going to do a promo, and I don't know how you guys feel, but I think that that's such a specific sales tool um, that I don't, usually we involve the producers and the filmmakers to the extent that they insist on being involved, I'll be frank, but we're, uh, our promos are geared towards Fire. putting it really stupidly like 400 old white guys. I mean, it's the it's the group of buyers that are a very um, it's a very set group of buyers that we we know all of them. Uh, we know all the key guys. It's mostly men, um, and so we have to help this specific group understand how they're going to market that film to young girls, to a horror audience, etc. So it's not a it's not a normal trailer because it's not about getting your average audience into a seat. It's about getting the buyers to understand. So that is the pre-EPK. It's, it's a different piece of material that we create for the buyers. Um, and so that's something we do, whether it's written material, whether it's visual, whether it's sock puppets, uh, whatever it is uh, that we do to get the buyers to understand what the film is going to be so that they will give us big checks. There's a reason why filmmakers are often discouraged by sales agents from seeing the sales process of their projects at a market. And when you think about it, it's, there, there are three major barriers to getting your film sold. Three different sales efforts have to, have to occur. The first being that you have to sell your project to the sales agent, convince them to get on board and to give, the, give you a minimum guarantee. The second is the sales agent then has to take the project and convince a distributor to buy it and recoup some sort of minimum guarantee territory by territory. And finally, once the distributor has the project, they have to go sell it to the audience and convince the audience to show up to the theaters or buy it on demand so that overall there's enough revenue and profits trickling all their way back across those three barriers back to you. No wonder everybody goes back to trying to find elements such as stars, actors, and genres that transcend all of the language barriers, the territory barriers, and that is an easier sales process. Because with such complex calculus across all these different levels, you need a simple language that everybody can understand beginning to end. Which is actually gonna be part of the next segment where we go back to these sales uh, heads and ask them about their process for raising financing in a marketplace where it's very hard to get access to bankable talent. So how do you get new talent to break in to this process and into the industry? So stay tuned for that in our next segment. Until then, don't forget to subscribe. See you around.